the message uh, this morning is flowing from the same overall point that we saw the last time I preached two weeks ago. We looked at the verses just immediately preceding our passage today. We looked at verses 13 through 17 of chapter 2 in 1 Peter. The idea then and sort of feeding into what we're doing, although we're going to see a slight transition, at least in application here, is the submission to social authorities that God himself has engineered. We submit to God by submitting to those authorities that he has placed over us in the variety of ways in society. Now Peter speaks immediately to those that are in the lowest of society, the lowest rung of society, speaking to slaves, quite literally. That Peter is concerned here in verse 18 to speak to these servants, to speak to slaves, those are in, who are in legal bondage, is impressive. When many in society would almost live as if they don't exist, Peter speaks to them directly. Remember the background to our letter in 1 Peter? Uh, Those Christians that are originally receiving this in Asia Minor, across what is now Turkey and the northern portion of that country, uh, these Roman provinces, these believers are suffering. Hardship is not a, a distant idea to them. It's not some vague idea that they're trying to understand hypothetically. It's immediate to them. It's real to them. And perhaps the same is true for some of us. Perhaps some of you, certainly some of you have, perhaps some of you are even undergoing trials right now that are pushing you to the very brink. You, you don't know how you're going to even go forward. You feel beat down and worn out. And we ask ourselves quite naturally, what are Christians supposed to think of such hardships? How do, how do we think about suffering and how do we live in the midst of suffering? These are good and real questions. We, we find ourselves asking even, even more pressing questions in the midst of suffering. Where is God in my suffering? Does he, does he even know what I'm going through? Does, does he even care? Many of us have asked those questions. Some of you are asking them right now. And I tell you, on terms of 1 Peter verses 18, or chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, take heart. The Holy Spirit, through his word, speaks to us today. In our text, Peter commands even servants to submit to their station in life and to do so with respect and patience knowing that Christ himself suffered even for our sins. Let's read the text together. Again, 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 18, through the rest of the chapter. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it, If when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. No matter our state in life, Christians should follow Christ's example of patiently enduring suffering, completely trusting in God. And in response to our message, may we model such faithful, patient endurance on account of our Lord, the good shepherd who suffered, who died to save his sheep. Would you pray with me? O holy God, I commit this time to you. I pray that you would work 
through your word now. Amen. My message has two parts. Here's the first, following the text. In faith, we are called to submit to suffering. Verse 18 is setting up for us. Again, in in one point, it's it's following the message we saw last, but as far as application, it's leading us somewhere else. But, But even that first word in most translations is setting us up here. It says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. God calls us to admit to whatever station in life he puts us, whatever it may be. Quite simply, yes, the, the text here is referring to slavery. Some of your translations will use the word slave or, or, or slavery here in the, in the context. Uh, the, word, the word is the same one. It's the same idea that we think of when we see bond servant in some translations. It's someone who is owned by someone else in forced servitude in the Roman world. Now, it's easy for us to read some modern ideas of slavery, perhaps how we we think we understand slavery in 19th century America. It's not quite fair to read those things back into the ancient world, but quite simply, it's still human bondage. They're being owned by someone else. Not exactly what we would call an ideal life, right? And this is somewhat shocking to us. Remember, just a couple weeks ago, first Peter is telling us to honor evil pagan rulers and Submit to them. We don't like that. We, we don't want that. If, 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 we're, if we're willing to submit to anyone at all, we want it to be people who are righteous and just. But submit to even a pagan ruler like Nero, the man who's emperor at the time. And now he's calling us to, get, to submit to even our given role if it's something as extreme as slavery. Certainly some of, if not many of, if not a majority of, the people who are originally receiving this letter are actually slaves. So again, this is not hypothetical. A a large portion of the early church were slaves and those from the lowest rung of society. Uh, We see uh, echoes of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, for instance. We know this to be true. It It was very common for the first people to be saved in areas to be slaves, and they would be God's witnesses, sometimes even witnessing to their owners and the children of their owners and so on. So this is a real thing. This is, it's not really a declaration about the institution of slavery as much as it is about societal order and our call to suffering through that, even legal bondage. But the thing that I want to point out here is that Peter's writing something to the real world. The Bible, and this is true not just in the New Testament, it's true everywhere, the Bible is not some mythological sort of idealistic world off in the distance somewhere. It's about real life. It's written to real people. We see them warts and all, all their imperfections. That's something that points to the Bible's authenticity. It's not simply a story about fairies and a happily ever after ending and these sort of vague ideas that we know from mythology or even what we think of in, in modern mythological stories, if you will. It's real people. This included slavery. Slavery was all over the ancient world. But maybe it's not slavery for us, right? Slavery, at least as a legal institution, has been eradicated in the modern world and in developed countries. So maybe it's not that for you. But maybe your situation in life includes other things, other modes of suffering. Maybe it's physical sickness that's just debilitating and wearing on you. Maybe it's something you've suffered with for years. Maybe it's cancer. How are you suffering through that. Maybe it's, maybe it's a tough family situation with children or with, uh, between a husband and wife. Maybe you don't have any family. That's its own problem. So maybe it's that sort of hardship that you're suffering through. Maybe it's a financial burden. You might feel like a slave to those people who owe your, you owe debt. We know that today as Americans very well, the the problem of debt and how burdensome that is. And so I ask you as a Christian, how are you handling the hardship that God has placed you in? The life in which you're in. How are you handling hardship? Do you suffer with a spirit of submission and patience? Or are you tempted to become angry, bitter, or just disillusioned? The Holy Spirit tells us to accept the circumstance that God has given us and trust in him. That's what we call faith, trust. 
even in the most difficult of situations. God expects us to honor social authorities, government, family, business, but we should trust in God's providence to direct us. And we should find contentment in those situations, whatever they might be. Submission, very simply, is an essential part of our Christian sojourning church. Look at verse 19 with me. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Peter tells us here, when you're suffering, when you're going through hardships, don't do so thoughtlessly. Rather, be mindful of God in the midst of suffering. Notice that Peter is assuming injustice. He's assuming that these things, that's, that's no surprise to us when we think of the idea of human bondage for servitude. Injustice very easily follows that. Our world is broken. We should expect pain. When it comes, remember the Lord. You don't suffer alone. We do what is pleasing to God if we are mindful of him and we willingly suffer patiently. One very extreme example comes to mind in the history of the church. John Calvin, very important Christian figure in the 16th century Protestant Reformation from which tradition we follow. And he had married and his wife had conceived and she was giving birth to a child that was sickly. The child soon died, I believe, within a matter of days after. Such pain, thinking about that. And Calvin said something that is really hard for us to grasp. He said, as he suffered according to this pattern, the Lord has inflicted a severe and bitter wound in the death of our infant son. But he himself is a father and knows what is good for his children. it's hard for me to even ask myself, how would I respond in such a situation if I lost a child? Some of you know what that feels like. What does it mean to be mindful during suffering as we look back at 19 here? Very simply, I can describe it in one word, trust. That we trust God, even in the midst of the most difficult situations. But one commentator gives an important clarification. Wayne Grudem says, it's not a stoic, self-motivated tenacity which holds out against all opposition, but rather is the opposite, the trusting awareness of God's presence and never failing care, which is the key to righteous suffering. Look at verse 20 with me. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So the first thing he says is there's no blessing for the person who's bringing on his own suffering. So if it's self-induced suffering, you know, if you're, if you're in jail because you embezzled money for your company, well, there's no reward in that. You've brought that on yourself. There's forgiveness available for that. But as far as reward and God's grace for that, in that sense, well, he's saying, no, there's no reward for that. You can try to be pious about it, but that's just called justice. But, he says, if you suffer true injustice with holiness, you honor God. There is reward for that. It is a commendable thing before God. This is completely contrary to the impulses of the world, to sort of accept hardship. Even our own nature, our sinful nature, rages against that idea. Some of you even feel that as we read the text. In our flesh, we want to be angry. If if revenge is attainable, we want to seek it. And if it's not, we want to threaten with it. That's how our soul rages in our flesh. But if we can, you know, if if, if suffering comes, if, if it's something against us, we want to sue for it. We want justice. It, well, it's not justice that we want. We want revenge. If we can, we want to make sure that, that someone who's wronged us, at the very least, we give them an earful. So we say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to actually physically do anything, but I'm going to make sure they know how I feel. That's, that's how we respond in our flesh. But is that what the word is calling us to do? 
That's not God's way. And in a moment, we're going to see how Jesus models that. The other thing I want you to see from this is that suffering is not random. It's not a surprise to God. It's not taking him uh, by surprise. He's not being caught off guard. In a real way, it is our calling. As we see at the beginning of verse 21, for to this you have been called, he says. Can you trust God even in the midst of that suffering? It's easy to trust God when all is well. And that's good. We need to to say, God, I've got all the money I need in my bank account to pay my bills this month. I, I feel good. Thank you. Well, that's, that's good. We should be thankful. God, I'm healthy and everyone in my family is healthy. All, all in life seems to be good. It's, it's much easier in those good times to have faith and gratitude. But what about when things are hard? Taking hold of this first truth is difficult and would be much more difficult if not for my second point. Yes, Christians are called to patiently endure suffering regarding or whatever, regardless the position in their life. But the word reminds us that Christ is our model. We can preserve, we can persevere through suffering because he did. Christ did. In our suffering, we receive the fellowship of Christ who understands our suffering. So yes, in faith, we're called to submit to suffering. But now secondly, in faithfulness, Christ submitted, submitting, submitted, excuse me, Christ submitted to suffering for us. This second section here is so reliant on Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 through chapter 53 through verse 12, the famous suffering servant song. We don't have time to really work through this. As, as I read it, it's, it's such a, a wonderful passage. I was so moved even this morning. I'm, I'm so tempted to read it, but it's a long passage. So please let me encourage you, maybe in your devotional time this week, read that passage. Peter is going to be drawing from it. He's quoting from it. He's echoing it. But I really encourage you, what an edifying read, to read Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through chapter 53, verse 12, the suffering servant song. And as you read it, you'll see these ideas that Peter is bringing forth. And he begins doing so in verse 21. He says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Peter tells us that we are called to follow Christ, even through suffering, even through hardship. Very honestly here, the question is not, will you suffer in life? The question is, how will you suffer? So this is not a thing unique to Christianity. This is a thing unique, this is a thing for all people. This world is hard. I had a conversation with a family member this week. Uh, He was over at our house and we were talking about this and he said something effective. Well, you know, your, your life's been pretty good. You've not really had hardship, are you? And I said, you know, it, it's really not fair to ask that question. Because number one, we should never assume that everything is perfect in another person's life. Because just, just because they don't tell you or they don't show it doesn't mean there's not a great deal of suffering going on inside. We, sh- we should assume a lot less in regards to other people and the hardships they endure. But the other thing that's not fair is that all of us suffer in some way. Now, granted, some suffer more than others. A a child who is suffering in the sense of not having a meal or the most basic necessities of life, yeah, that's a real kind of suffering, and that is an extreme form of suffering. I'm not undermining that. But a a middle-class American who seems to have everything together can still suffer a unique form of anxiety because she's been trying to conceive of a child for 12 years and has never found it. That's suffering, too. And so there are different levels and there's different ways, but we all suffer hardships. Those who promote the Christian life as as one of certain health and wealth and prosperity, they're selling a lie. They're not reading the New Testament. I don't know how else they could be. They're maybe cherry-picking ideas out based on their own preconceived notion beforehand. But this is not the picture of the New Testament for our life. It was not the picture of our Messiah. He suffered. And also, and we're going to talk about more of this in a moment, but when we speak about Christ's suffering, we're going to see not only his suffering on the cross, his passion. That's certainly the sort of epicenter of that. 
But he's called a man of, man of sorrows in the sense of his whole life. It, condescending, coming from heaven in all perfection and, and all that is bliss coming to live on earth to suffer physical sickness and, and want and anxiety and hunger and all the problems that we deal with. His life was a suffering example for us as well, not only in his passion. So I ask you, you want to be like Jesus? You want to follow Jesus? I I pray that we would all say yes, yes. We'll endure sufferings with patience and faith. When Christ says, take up my cross and follow me, be willing to do that. We might need to even think, rethink our priorities as we think of Christian role models. It's, it's natural for us in sort of a celebrity culture to look in, at the person with great gifts, the, the person that has a lot of outward manifestations that seem to be impressive. It's, it's, it's easy for us to look and be impressed by that. But maybe we should rethink that and maybe we should ask questions about how does he do in hardship? How does he deal with adversity? That makes someone great in a different way. I'll be very honest with you. When I ask about a person's character, I'm not asking, hey, how do you deal when everything's right and everything's good? I ask, how do you deal with hardship? How would you deal with adversity in your life? I ask them questions like that. If I were sitting down to to hire a a church staff member, that's what I'm going to ask. How will you act when not, or when when things are not all well? Christ, the Holy Spirit says through the word, is our model. Jesus, as he lived on earth, he was not a revolutionary. He did not come to overthrow Rome and, and to do the sorts of things that even many of his followers expected, many of the Jews expected. He was not a social revolutionary. In fact, he's reinforcing it in some ways. He was not a a secular sage simply trying to bring in wisdom and spread ideas as sort of a moral teacher. He was not that. He was, uh, according to Isaiah 52 and 53, and now according to Peter, he was a suffering servant. He modeled perfect holiness for us through a hard life. Look at verse 22 with me. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. The Holy Spirit tells us that Jesus suffered in perfect innocence. And I mean that in two ways. He was innocent when he submitted himself to suffering, and he was innocent through the duration. Both are important. This is true, again, as I said a moment ago, of the cross, but it's true of his whole earthly life. His life is a a picture of that for us. Again, being the second Adam, fulfilling all that Adam and that all people since Adam, all of Adam's children have failed to do. When you feel like no one understands your pain, when you're tempted to despair and say that I'm all alone and no one understands the problems that I'm going through, Christ does. He suffered in all the ways that we do. He was tempted in all the ways that we are. Look to Christ in that moment. Look to Christ. The adversary wants the exact opposite of you. He wants you to look at yourself and pop culture tells you, look inside yourself and find your your inner strength and follow your heart and all these ridiculous ideas. It's nonsense. Don't look within yourself. Look to God. There's a lot of really frightening things when you look within yourself. Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. When you realize that you're not able, when you're not able to live out this perfect life, when you're not able to suffer in perfect holiness through your suffering, understand that Christ did it for you. He's your example. He's your model. That's the gospel. We uh, see this perfect perfect model given by the law of God in the scriptures, and we know we fall short. In fact, that's one of the purposes of the law. We look at it and we see, wow, I can't meet up to that. And yet Christ says, I can, and I'm going to do it for you. He's our model. He suffered for you in your place and for your benefit. Verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But continued entrusting himself, so important, 
continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus endured suffering with patience and faith. That's the key here. This this last clause in verse 23 is the key to understanding this. Jesus had faith in God. That's how he endured suffering the way in which he did. Again, it's not self-faith. It's not pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. If you're going to endure suffering with holiness, as Peter is commanding here, you must have faith in God. There's no other way. There is no other way. Uh, the, the, the phrase here is so important. It says, Jesus committed himself to the Father in faith. It's, it's the same word that's used even of putting one in, in prison when uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, I believe, the, uh, who later became the apostle Paul, Saul is committing Christians to prison when he's persecuting them. The idea of giving himself up, abandoning of oneself, I think is, is, is an inherent idea there. Giving himself to the Father in faith. It's the sense of being committed. As Christians, we do this because we trust in God's vindication. We trust in his justice. We couldn't do this if God was not holy. But because he's holy and we trust he's going to make all things right one day, we can commit ourselves to him knowing that he is good, that he is faithful, that he is holy and just. In this world, justice is always incomplete. Uh, Joy and I, especially on Friday nights, we watch, uh, it's kind of our Friday night tradition. We get the kids to bed and I believe it comes on at at nine or 10 o'clock. We watch uh, the Dateline specials. It's usually a, you know, murder mystery. It's it's always the husband who kills the wife or the wife that kills the husband. So we always know that, but they make it fun. And at the end, I know it's, it's true. They always try to bring in other suspects and maybe it was the neighbor. No, it was the husband or it was the wife. Always, always. Remember that. We, we enjoy watching these crime shows. They, they make it dramatized. And, but at the end, even when the person has tr- uh, very clearly been proven to be guilty, he's prosecuted, she's prosecuted, they're given a, what seems to be a just sentence, even going through all that on the outside and, and from the world, we want to look at that and say, oh yeah, justice has been served. It's always incomplete. You ask the person who has lost a loved one and say, oh, it has just been served. Do you feel like everything is sort of settled now? No, it doesn't bring the person back. It doesn't ultimately take away those feelings of grief. There's, there's, some, uh, there's some part of it that is incomplete. But Christians have faith that God will make all things right one day. The short term is bearable. Because in the end, we trust that he will demonstrate perfect justice and retribution against evil. And bring in all which is good. That's the God that we trust. We trust in his holiness. And here in verse 24, we see this clear and compelling depiction of the gospel. Bringing it home. He himself bore our sins in his body. He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Coming directly from Isaiah, obviously. Those those words are ringing for those of you who know the text. The Holy Spirit tells us that Jesus suffered for us. It's not, again, it's sort of taking away the the sort of vague ideas that we have. Well, we know he suffered and maybe he he suffered, you know, in some way as sort of an example. I'm, I'm telling you that he's a model, but it's not, that's not all there is. He suffered for us. It's personal. The, the big theological way that we say it is penal substitution, that he took the penalty that is ours as our substitute. He took the wrath that we deserved as sinners, although he was innocent, and he owned it. He took it. He took the burdens of our sins, and he paid the debt. He could do that because he was God. No no man, no woman, no human could absorb that and live. But Christ absorbed it and was raised to everlasting life. And he still exists as Christ, as the incarnate Son as our mediator, 
He died also. So in, in that very particular way, he died as our substitute. He died taking our penalty. But he also died so that we, being freed of that burden, could live in righteousness. See that there in the text. So we're not destined to fail. We're not destined to be owned by sin and to be pummeled by sin. We are free to live in righteousness and obedience and in satisfaction on account of what he has done. The text also says, the, the way there at the end of the, the, the verse, the last sentence in my translation, by his wounds you have been healed. A powerful image. He suffered to heal us. Church, he, he healed us from the life-threatening disease which had, no other, which had no other remedy. He died to take away the burden of sin, this life-threatening disease that, that had a, an eternal punishment with it. He died taking that as our only cure. Church, if you've ever wondered... Does, does God really love me? Does, does God really care about me? If you have ever wondered or doubted that, here's the only proof you need. He died for you. If indeed you are in Christ, he died for you. That's no metaphor. Jesus Christ gave his life to die for sinners. Verse 25. Verse 25. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The gospel is a message of reconciliation. We were lost and estranged like sheep. We wandered around not knowing our way. But in Christ, God has brought us back home. He's brought us back where we belong with him. His own people are with him. He reconciled us to himself by himself. So there was no outside force at work, some force outside or independent of God. He was motivated in love and did this himself intentionally, thoughtfully. He reconciled us through the sufferings of Jesus Christ, the son, the second member of the Trinity. This image of Christ as our shepherd is a beautiful one. He protects us. He knows us. He keeps us. This is a picture of the gospel. It's, it's spelled out so wonderfully in John chapter 10. And again, another great text for you to read in your devotional time as you reflect on the principles here in this. The way that he keeps us, knows us, preserves us. That we will never be lost. No, no one. As I said earlier, the question is not, will you suffer in this life? You, you will. I pray that God spares you of suffering, but we know that, that suffering is part of living in this world. This life is painful. The world is broken. Those things cry out to the gospel. I said that this week with the San Bernardino shootings. What do we think about this as Christians? That's God's alarm going off. This world is broken. It needs redemption. The, the foolish idea that, that says that, that men are inherently good, how can we believe that? Tell that to the people whose family members were slaughtered this week. Uh, people are basically good. Really? No, oh, they're not. This world is broken. And those of us who have not been reconciled to God that are still in our sins are broken. The question is, how will you suffer? To what will you look for in those hard times? For guidance, for hope. I pray that you would look to Christ. Christ. There is hope in no one else and no thing else. Will suffering make you bitter, angry, hardened, delusional? I, I add delusional because that's one we don't often think about. But sometimes suffering is so hard on someone they just go crazy. Is that the result of suffering that you will go through? Or will you rest in the one who suffered for you? Because when you rest in the one who suffered for you, you enter into eternal life in which sufferings will forever cease. We can have patience and contentment and joy in this life because we know it's not all there is. 
If it was, what a pathetic existence. John MacArthur has a really powerful quotation on this. He says, The apostles suggest that the intense but comparatively trifling amount of suffering believers experience in this life will result in an infinitely greater weight of glory in the life to come. I pray that you would suffer according to the grace of Jesus Christ in obedience according to his model. I pray all the more and with that, that God would would open your heart to believe that gospel and that it would be what drives you and carries you through hardship. Let's pray. 